As is the case, as is often the case, this is a message that God first gave to me to speak to the men. We had a tremendous meeting this past Tuesday night with the men. I want to salute the brothers. The fellowship hall was literally filled with men. Men and their sons. Coach. Lester, his tall skyscraping self, with his skyscraping son. Look like the, the, the power forward and the center walked in together. And uh, men, um, and the men are attentive. And I, brothers, I appreciate the hour of time that you give me on those Thursday, Tuesday nights. And we work hard to keep it within the hour. And it, th there's no honor to me, and I'm glad for everybody, but th th there's a, there is a honor, there's a grace that accompanies just standing up in a room that's filled with men. And the men are gathered together not to hear some hip-hop show, not to drink, we're not there for sports, we're not there for any of those things, but we're gathered to hear a word from the Lord that will make us better husbands, better dads, better citizens, better men. Men are under attack. Manhood is under attack in this country today. Masculinity is under attack. Praise the Lord. We live in a nation now that celebrates perversion. You look at, look at the commercials that air on television and look at the role that most of us play in the commercials. We are being uh, 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 silly and, and, and uh, stupid. Uh, most dads in a commercial, the dad is a klutz. Uh, even in the Kia commercial and selling a car, the young girl on, in the commercial speaks with dignity and plainness of speech and she's articulate. The little boy is stupid. He's bringing out balloons that they wave off that they don't need. Whether it's little boys or all, all the way up to grown men, men are under attack. I enjoyed the Cosby show back in the day until Dad Huxtable began. He went from being a good leader in the house, the character now, uh, to being a fool, a klutz, a stupid man. Even the baby was smarter than he was. I stopped watching it at that point because I understand that everything we look at is trying to condition our thinking. And in the African-American community in particular, our men, brothers, we got to understand that we, we've got to be sharp. Uh, married men, single men, brothers, we got to be strong, masculine, go to school and learn. Be intelligent. Don't be uh, ashamed to be smart. Amen. And, uh, and if you do, the Lord will bless us. Other communities teach their men to be strong. And so we had a tremendous meeting, and the Lord dealt with me con concerning this as I was seeking him. The Lord said, no, I want you to preach this to the church. This message today deals with the fact that people who see clearly are never liked by those who are blind to what is going on. There's a clash between the believers who see what's going on and the people who are just blind. I watched as the, the country of Ireland celebrated yesterday. The applause in the streets and the joy on the faces of the Irish as they celebrated in mass. This 
country that is overwhelmingly Catholic, like what? What is the percentage Catholic? 80% or more Catholic country. And they celebrated. The, the Catholics voted uh, to change the abortion laws. Uh, in Ireland, you couldn't have an abortion. And, and no one would be surprised. In a predominantly Catholic country, you would, you would think that the, a predominantly Catholic country would have strict abortion laws in a predominantly Catholic country. And those Catholics got out there and voted to change the law. The law was that uh, unless, except in the case of the life of the mother, you couldn't, a, a, a woman in Ireland could not have an abortion in Ireland. If she, she could leave the country and have one, but she couldn't have one in Ireland. And that strict law was put in place, I think, around 1980. And uh, they voted to overturn that. And oh, they were just cheering in the streets. Now we can kill our babies. Woo, we're so happy. And as I looked at some of those who were clapping, I thought to myself, many of you are alive only because that in 1980, your mother couldn't leave the country and she had to give birth to you. And there you stand clapping that that which is responsible for your being here has been overturned. Oh, God, what in the world has happened is happening to this world. That's wickedness. Two, three years ago, they voted to, uh, for, to, bring, to make same-sex marriage the law in Ireland. So let's see. All right, see how these, these last two major seismic shifts in their society is going to help them in terms of population. You don't get children from same-sex marriages. Amen. And, uh, and then you throw in abortion and, and, and make it fashionable and legal to kill them, then um, uh, that doesn't help the situation. And those people think that they're being progressive and modern, and they celebrate it. They're blind. And those who see clearly See the error of that country on that island that they share with Scotland. The message, this message also, this is also a message that raised the larger theological issues that existed at the time. Everyone there, especially on the Israeli side, thought that it was a military standoff, that Israel had a military problem. David didn't see it that way at all. To David, it was not a military problem. In his eyes, it was a theological problem. Because to David, there was a man standing there defying the living God. And much of what we see in politics today is not political. It's theological. It's theological. Who told us that God brought the female to the male and endorsed marriage and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife? Where did we learn this? We learned it in the Bible. So when they endorse other forms of marriage other than a man and a woman, that's not just a political issue. That's a theological one. For if we can't trust the God of the Bible and we can't trust the Bible with regard to the definition of marriage, can we trust it with anything else? When the schools brought in evolution, the theory of evolution, and they adopted the theory of evolution instead of creationism, that wasn't a mere uh, educational matter. That was a theological matter. For we learn from the Bible that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, if you drop that and believe that some gas that you don't know where it came from, 
exploded. You don't know what caused the explosion. And it blew up and behold, we have a universe. Well, then that means you, you believed a lie. A theory. Theory by definition. Uh, it, uh, uh, a theory is unproven. See, uh, evolution was initially uh, presented as a theory. We dropped the word theory. But it's unproven. It makes no sense. Nothing cannot explode and become a universe. That is delicately and intricately designed. That is, that is complex. Oh my. That operates on a com complex order and a complex system. And it functions every day. Praise the Lord. Nothing can can explode and bring these things into being. David saw clearly, we don't have a military problem. We have a, a problem of disrespect to the God of Israel. This message is about the effect experiences with God or the lack thereof have on, the, on people's perceptions and on how people handle situations. Where you've been with God determines how you respond to life's situations. There are so many things today. This message also shows why Eliab, Abinadab, and Shema, David's eldest three brothers, there were eight of them in all, why they were rejected and why David was anointed to be the next king of Israel. And one more thing. The statement, can't I ask a question, reveals how David saw himself and his role in the situation. I think it was the basketball player, Allen Iverson, who was dubbed the answer. But Iverson never won a championship. David was the answer that day. And he won the championship. David saw himself as the remedy to the dilemma that existed at the time. He says, I am the answer to this situation. The goal of this message and the aim of this message, I want you to pray with me now, is for us to see ourselves, our church, our ministry, our very saved existence, and all of our lives, experiences up until now as preparation for the things that we face today. That we have a role in society. Not just me, but you, us together. That we are called for such a time as this. That we want to go from needing to be constantly delivered to being deliverers and showing people that there is a reality to serving the God of the Bible. Amen. I believe, Upper Room, that everything that, that has happened in our lives up until now ha has been preparation for the challenges of this day. Amen. I believe that Jesus will use us to be a blessing. To be a remedy. Amen. To be an answer for somebody. We are anointed. The body of Christ. We are anointed. To in fact. Withstand. And defeat. The Goliaths. Of our day. Are you praying with me? Let's peruse the text, chapter 17. First point I want you to be aware of is what we're about to talk about, what we described in the text, according to verse 16, had already, it, it, it took place for 
40 days in a row before David got there. For 40 days, the Philistines were challenging the armies of God. And also, number two, I want you to know that according to verse one, this conflict resulted as was the result of an invasion. The Philistines invaded the territory of Israel. We're told in verse one clearly that Sokol, where the Philistines were gathered, belongeth to Judah. The Philistines had left Ekron and traveled about 10 miles into Judah in Israeli territory to wage this battle. I want to say to you again, there's no point in trying to hide in the shadow. So if I don't say anything to the devil, Satan won't say anything to me. No, Satan will find out where you live. And walk all up in your house and say, I'm here. What are you going to do about it? It was an invasion. The Philistines invaded Judah. Now, it was not so long ago in chapter 15, if you study it, that the Philistines had, were soundly defeated by Saul in Israel. But here we have them making head again. One thing about the devil, you know, you defeat him, you can beat him good, but now he leaves for a season. And you celebrate that respite, but just know that he's coming back. So here are the Philistines again. Somebody said, not again. Well, here they are, they're back to fight. The Philistines had probably, it is likely, uh, that the word had gotten to them that Saul and Samuel had fallen out. By now, Saul had disobeyed Samuel twice. And God had rejected Saul. And Samuel had forsaken Saul. And Saul had grown melancholy and un. That was an evil spirit. That was a spirit that would come upon Saul. And Saul would withdraw himself. And uh, only a little shepherd boy. Shepherd boy was hired to play skillfully. They got Rocky to play for him. To drive that evil spirit away. Well, Satan figured, uh, the Philistines figured, this would be a good time. To make our move. Samuel and Saul has fallen out. Uh, God has forsaken Saul. Praise the Lord. And Saul is distracted with this fit that would come over him. Now's a good time to make our move. See what the Philistines didn't know was that God had already anointed someone else to be the king of Israel. So if you read verse two through three, you can read this when you get home. Saul mustered up his forces to face them. And he faced them in a place called Elah. Elah was a valley. Elah was the low place. It was the middle ground between where the two armies were gathered. Elah was about 10 miles or so uh, west of Jerusalem. So the armies are gathered. Now you have to give the Philistines credit because they came this time with a different method of attack. And this is why you have to stay spiritual. It's why every one of us needs the Holy Ghost. See, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, you if you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to let the Lord fill you because Satan doesn't, doesn't come the same way every time. You know, the devil knows how to, to come in different ways. The Bible teaches that we are to put on the whole armor of God, that we may be able to withstand the wiles 
of the devil. Wiles there. Uh, the, uh, gives, come from the Greek word methodia. It gives us the English word method. Wiles means different methods of attack. Satan may come after you one way this time, but he may come another way the next time. Sometimes he comes with plan A, and then if that fails, plan B. If that fails, he comes with plan C. And then sometimes he comes with A, B, C, and D at the same time. He uses different methods. This is why we need to put on the whole arm. Why the believer has to stay prepared because none of us know what tomorrow may bring. None of us know what tomorrow's attack may be like. Praise the Lord. No matter how secure your position may be in life today, tomorrow you can still be on shaky ground. Doesn't take but one report from the doctor. Doesn't take but one person not paying attention, going through the intersection on a cell phone, texting as you go through. Doesn't take very much at all for one lady while sitting on the plane. The window went out and she was, I mean, who would have thought? Snatched out of the plane almost and lost her life. A freak accident like that. Talked to a preacher friend of mine yesterday and he told me he was on his way to a funeral. One of his friend's father was out in the yard doing yard work. Horticulturalist, just enjoying his yard work. And tripped and fell. Fell and bumped his head. No biggie, he got up and finished doing what he was doing. Went on in the house, everything was cool. Developed a little headache from that. The next day, went to the hospital. They looked and they saw a little clock. They said, we're gonna, we got this fixed. We're going to fix this. And he's, he's in the hospital there. He's talking to everybody. Everything's good. Nothing's going wrong. Everything's good. The man dies. Gone. 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 That quickly. Very little notice. Gone. This is why. We need the whole armor. See, he doesn't need the armor, but his, 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 uh, his loved ones, the survivors do, because that's a tough, they have a tough role to hold in dealing with losing their loved ones, their loved one that way. When, in the previous battles, when Saul fought against the Philistines, when he fought against Palestine, it was the army of Israel fighting their army. This time, they come up with a different battle style. This time, instead of the two armies clashing as they were known to do, the first time said, no, no, no. Israeli army, you stay over there on your side. And uh, we'll stay over here on our side of the valley of Elah. And, and we have a champion. We have a middleman. We have one man who will go out and fight for us. You send your best man to fight our best man. And whoever wins, with the minimal loss of life, whoever wins, then that person, that army rules. So, all of a sudden, stepping out to fight for the Philistines was their champion whose name was Goliath. Verse 4 through 7, read it when you get home. Uh, Goliath, according to the Hebrew text, was nine feet, nine inches tall. Six cubit and a, fan, and a span. The tallest human being in modern times was Robert Waldlow. 
Robert Waldo was eight feet 11, 11 inches tall before his death in 1940. It is believed that Goliath himself must have weighed somewhere between 600 and 700 pounds. He was many times stronger than a normal man, Goliath. He wore 175 pounds of armor alone and could fight in it could move with wearing 175 pounds of armor. The head of his spear weighed 15 pounds. And he was a menacing sight to see. Someone said one time that Goliath was not all of that, that he was, he was sickly, he had... Uh, a disease and all that kind of stuff. No, no, that's, that, that doesn't jive with the facts. And it wouldn't have made sense. It wouldn't have made sense. If he was just a tall, lanky uh, tree, looked like uh, he could drop dead any time, propped up, somebody would have fought him. No, 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 no. When he walked out, when he walked out, because let me tell you, let me tell you, the army that was afraid of him was not an army that didn't know victory. It was not an army that wasn't given to fighting. The Israeli army fought under Saul. We don't talk enough about Saul's warrior days. But this man, this battle, was something unlike they'd ever seen before. Sometimes you go through things that you're accustomed to. Then all of a sudden, Shekinah, there's a challenge that's unlike anything. Am I right about it? That you've had to face before. This is different. This is a Goliath. But for every Goliath, God has a David. Hallelujah. For every challenge, the Lord has an answer for you. Can I get a witness? So now, here's this man, 600 to 700 pounds, nine feet, nine inches tall, a warrior from his youth, trained to fight, body covered with armor, Ankles covered with armor and then had an armor bearer to bring his shield out. Oh my. We face Goliaths. Abortion is a Goliath disproportionately affecting the black community. Almost 2,000 black babies per day. Black lives tough, snuffed out. There should be in this country at least 70 million African Americans. At least. At least. We have, according to the Douglas Foundation, we have aborted more of us, more black babies than slaves, than black slaves that were brought to this country throughout the entire slave trade. Our numbers of going into the clinic and exterminating our own has exceeded the number of us that were sold into this country into slavery in, in the bondage. And I, 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 I'm somewhat taken aback by our seeming romantic, the romantic relationship, the romanticization that we have with Africa and our homeland. And we have a, a longing for Africa. Motherland. And, and, and in that same sentence, we can have such a hatred for those white folk who brought us uh, into slavery. But we seem to excuse the fact that we were sold into slavery. We were not sold into slavery by whites. 
We were sold into slavery by black Africans. White people had no black people to sell. Native Americans were Indians. We sent the word out. Africa sent the word out. We have slaves for sale. 20 to 30 percent of the slave trade went to America. But today, Goliath is destroying us. Hispanics now outnumber us. The LGBTQ and whatever else, whatever other letter is a Goliath in our society. Our boys and girls are being turned out. We're celebrating wicked, ungodly lifestyles. They're not really lifestyles, they're death styles. Because if everybody practiced it, it would mean the extinction of the human race in less than a hundred years. If everybody went homosexual, if everybody went lesbian, if, ever, if all women turned to women, and if all men turned to men, and there was no in vitro fertilization and no false ways to make babies. It would mean the extinction, uh, the extinction of the human race in less than a hundred years. We would be gone. Why do you think my brothers, God said, it is not good that the man, the male should be alone. In some things, when it comes to procreation, if you got 10,000 males, we're still alone. If you got a million men, there's a million men. When it comes to procreation, we're still alone. We don't get a partner until a lady show up. And uh, if there was an a island where there was 10,000 men and one woman, I tell you what would happen in a short period of time. There'd be 10,000 dead men because we kill each other trying to get to that one woman. <laughs> Say amen. Because I know I'd be in the fight. Oh yeah, because I don't want him. And ain't but one her. We fight. Well, I just sit over there in my corner and just praise the Lord. Well, praise him then. Why are you praising him? <laughs> I'm going to make my move. Say amen. <laughs> Men who think that they are women, transgender community, that is a Goliath. Sick people, deranged people. You got to be out of your mind to believe that you are a woman trapped in a man's body or a man trapped in a woman's body. You got to be crazy. There's a word for that. The, 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 uh, the American Psychiatric Association used to, look, they'd lock you up for that until those people invaded the, um, the American Psychiatric Association. Once they invaded it, they, it began to be labeled differently. I would love to ask the association what changed. Since their behavior didn't, what changed? That's a Goliath. The attack on biblical Christianity is a Goliath in our society. This growth of universalism, these movements that seem to just, uh, just, just sweep us away, the, the, the wake movement, the kinetic movement, all of these Movements, these things are Goliaths. The rejection of the rule of law is a Goliath. Rogue police officers. Rogue police officers. Exercising unwarranted violence against African American men is a Goliath. The disrespect for police officers. Murder of those who serve in uniform. In many cases, just because they had the uniform on is a Goliath. 
Yes, yes, yes. We have Goliaths. Goliaths. Goliaths to deal with. And then the haranguing of Goliath. Goliath gives a speech. Verse 8 through 10 says, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, uh, said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? Uh -huh. And you, servants of Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight me, fight with me, and to kill me, then will I be your servants. Will we be your servants? But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, after he gave the rules of the engagement, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Oh, he made his stand. Didn't he, didn't he do it? And uh, on the other side, crickets. Verse 11 says, And when Saul and all Israel heard those words, heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were uh, disoriented. Their spirits were broken. There's a lot of churches today, a lot of preachers who are dismayed. They preach fancy sermons saying nothing. They attack nor deal with any of the defining issues of our day and time. They're afraid. They're demoralized. They're trying to stay in business. They're trying to keep a paycheck going. They ought to be, they ought, they ought to be ran off. They pick easy subjects and afraid to tackle the challenges of our time. Goliath has frightened them. You don't know why, you don't know where they stand on abortion. You don't know where they stand on a homosexuality. You don't know where they stand on adultery and fornication. You don't know where they stand. You got, you got preachers defending uh, the so-called legends of gospel for singing with uh, people like uh, Snoop Dogg and one one, one preacher said, who are we to tell Snoop Dogg uh, where he, whether or not he can let his voice be heard? If it's in here, who am I? The pastor. If it's in here, the shepherd. Let me tell you something. Every one of you have the right to say anything you want to say at any time you want to sit. Sing any song you want to sing. Praise the Lord. You can do it. You can do it. You have that right. Say whatever you want to say. But to have the right to be heard is a different story altogether because you got to earn the right to be heard. Oh, you can say what you want to in your shower, in your house, in your car, by yourself. But if you're going to stand right here, if you're going to stand here, you got to pass muster. Amen. I heard him say, thy rod and thy staff. The, 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 the shepherd put out his rod and he would measure the sheep by his rod. You got, to, you got to be saved. In time past, you had to be saved. You couldn't be no dope smoking, cussing rapper who just decide you want to sing a song and the next thing you know, saints buying your music. Something's wrong with that. Something's wrong with that. 
and, and 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the saints wouldn't have considered it. But in this day and time, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think nothing wrong with it myself. That I just said part of this message is those who see clearly. There's a divide between those who see clearly and those who are clearly blind. I'm preaching David and Goliath. The armies of Saul was demoralized. They were afraid and they were silent. They said nothing. And in biblical dramatic irony, the scene changes. Almost without warning. You wouldn't even notice it if you weren't paying attention. The scene shifts. It goes from the battlefield back over to Jesse's house. And uh, it says in uh, verse 13, uh, it says here, well, verse 12, now David, now David, shift and scene. Now David, the son of, uh, of that uh, Euphrathite uh, of Jerusalem, Judah, uh -huh, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man went among men uh, for an old man in the days of Saul. That is, Jesse was a respected man, but by now, he was an old man. He's an old man now. This old man had eight sons. And according to the text, three of his eight were a part of Saul's army. Verse 13 tells us that uh, Eliab and Abinadab and uh, uh, Shemaiah, uh, Shemaiah were in uh, the army. And David, verse 14, was the youngest and the three eldest followed Saul. David wasn't in Saul's army. Look at verse 15. But David went and returned from Saul, look at this now, to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. What an awesome young man David was. This is powerful. This speaks to his character. His brothers were in Saul's army. If you know anything about the text, by now, David had been, in chapter 16, anointed to be the next king of Israel. By now, David had been selected to be Saul's personal, personal musician. Uh, so that when that spirit would come over him, David would play, and he would play Saul back into being blessed. All this would happen by now. And by now, Saul had given Jesse a blessing so that David could live in Saul's palace. So David, by now, lived in the palace of Saul. But he still never stop leaving once his work was done. He would leave Saul's palace, go back down to his father's house and keep them same sheep. <laughs> Shepherding was the lowliest of tasks. See, some of us are much too high-minded. Much too high-minded. Oh, we've been elevated a little bit and we done left and when some things are beneath us, but you better learn how to, to hold to some of the small things. Don't make your move too soon. You'll hurt yourself. You'll hurt yourself. Young folk, you can't start out where your parents have ended up. You got to work your way to where they are. Some of us, it took years to get where we are, and you think you're gonna come out the blocks day one. Whether, whether if you're talking about home, whether you're talking about professional, the ministry, church, business, or whatever, praise the Lord. And as the Lord elevate you, don't let go of the, oh, the lowly things, the menial things too soon. Here is David, already anointed, anointed by Samuel to be the next king, 
living in Saul's palace. The battle is going on, but where do we find him? Back in his father's backyard. Shepherding the sheep. He still went home, praise the Lord, to take out the trash, to check out the home site, to make sure things was all right. My, my I wish I had a praying church. No, but wait a minute, Rocky. <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, that's not a signal. Praise the Lord. But I, but I felt it, though. I, I, so now, are you with me? So now we see four of Jesse's sons. Three in Saul's army. One uh, between Saul and his daddy. Between Saul and his daddy. Between Saul and his daddy. And you know what? Uh, Jesse, uh, David, uh, I'm preaching hard. David didn't make a move until his daddy told him to. See, had Jesse not said what he said in verse 17, David would have never been there. And Jesse said unto David, his son, take thou now, take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp uh, and run to the camp of thy brother. Uh, I know you've been anointed. I know you live in Saul's palace, but here, take this food. Go down to the battlefield and feed your brothers. See, you don't, don't you ever get so high that some things are beneath you. Praise the Lord. You better wait on the Lord. And stay humble. I can't get much help here. Stay humble. And when the time is right, God will elevate you. You can't make elevation happen. Bible said promotion cometh not from the from the, the east, the west, nor the south. But it is the Lord who takes down one and establishes another. He said to his son, go and take that food down there. Yeah. And, uh, and take it. See how your brothers are doing. And carry these, <laughs> these ten, look at this, ten cheeses unto the captain. Uh, of their of their thousands, yeah, you got to bless them too now. Praise the Lord! And look uh, how thy brethren fare, and take their pay. other words. See how your brothers are doing, and get a report and bring it back to me. So the Bible said, and now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah. Fighting with the Philistines. That is, they were standing there, not engaged, they, not engaged, but standing there, uh, uh, saber rattling, uh, right there in the in the valley. And so, praise God, David, in obedience to his father, praise the Lord. It was the obedience uh, to his dad that put him in the position to engage Goliath in the first place. Verse 20 tells us, and David, he didn't drag his feet. He rose up early in the morning. Now, this is the 41st day. He rose up early in the morning. And notice this, to workers, to take on one task, he didn't neglect enough. Now, my daddy has given me the task of taking this food to my brother's and these cheeses to the captains. And I got to find out how my brothers are doing. But I also have to keep my daddy's sheep. Now, I can't be negligent. Look at this. Look at this. Let me give a little lesson now on how to work. I can't be negligent uh, in one area because I've been assigned another area. Got to do it all. Can I get a witness? Bible said, praise the Lord, and he left the sheep uh, with a keeper. He didn't neglect it. He made sure that they were taken care of and took and went as Jesse commanded him. And he came to the trench. I'm in my text now uh, where the battle was going on. 
and where they were shouting for battle. At least they were saying something. Amen. The Philistines were shouting at Israel. And Israel was shouting at them. And except for Goliath, one was scared and the other was glad of it. And so there they are. And David rode on his carriage and left his carriage. I feel my help. And uh, he ran down to the army. And he came and he saluted his brothers. And uh, he, praise the Lord, was just doing what his daddy told him to do. But turns out it was a divine setup. Because while, notice this, verse 23 says, and as he talked with them, as David talked to his brothers, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shema, dad want to know how you're doing, guys. And they were talking with each other, and everything was fine. While they were talking, nine feet, nine inches, 500 to 600 pound, a Goliath got up and walked out there on the battlefield. But this time he came and he walked out into the valley of Elah. But I'm going to show you in a minute that he went from the valley and walked over on Israel's side and got up on the ravine and he was a little closer to the armies of Israel than he normally was. You see, when the devil gets bold, he come out of the closet. But I'm glad that God the Holy Ghost has given us something for the devil. I see you coming, Satan. But I got something to tell you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You ought to lift your hands and tell God thank you. So now, here it is. Here, Goliath came up. And the Philistine, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, he came, look at this, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. Oh, but something was different on the 41st day when he spoke from day one to day 40. David was either in the palace of Saul or he was in the backyard of Jesse keeping the sheep in the pasture. But on day 41, David wasn't in the palace and David wasn't in the pasture, but David was down by the battlefront. And the Bible said he spoke like he had spoken the other 40 days. But the difference is this time, David heard him. Good God Almighty, I wanna do have any Davids here. Does it make a difference in anybody's life when you hear about what they're going through? Does it make a difference in anybody's life when you hear about what Satan is trying to do? Leslie, it made a difference in a young lady's life when you heard what she was suffering. The next thing I know, you got up all the way in Greensboro. And we're going to meet after service and we're going to help that little baby and help him out. Why? Because, see, others heard, but nothing happened. But when it reached your ears, you begin to put things in motion. What happens when it reaches your ears? What happens when it reaches your ears? Do you act like you don't know? Do you ask yourself, what's in it for me? Do you walk on the other side of the street? Or can God count on you to make something happen when it reaches your ears? Yeah! Yeah! I wish I had a praying church today. Bible tells us here, uh-huh, Goliath. As David talked, Goliath spake, and David heard him. And when David heard, God's anointed heard. When David heard, the man whom God was with heard. And when David heard it, verse 24 says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled and were afraid. David's standing there looking at them. Where are they going? Why are they running? I heard what he said. Where are they going? See, thank God. You're going to get mad with me for this. But there's a lot of people of my own people 
in my own community who resent me in Upper Room by extension, they resent you because we dare think a different thought because we dare see things from a different angle. No, I'm not running when they tell me to run. No, I'm not afraid of what they are afraid of. My God, God gives us power to stand our ground. Somebody shout something for him. Hallelujah. They ran. So David, and begin to tell David, David, good God almighty, I'm almost done here. Just just wave your hands if, you, if you're getting something out of it. And they, they told David, they ran. And they said, David, say, they said in verse 25, the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who have come up? Come up means come out. Uh, that means he came a little closer. Surely to defy us, he's come up. Praise the Lord. And he's come up to, uh, uh, to kill us and, uh, and to defy our armies. And look at him now. Everybody's coming out the closet because they think Christians are weak. They think we're going to lay down and play dead. But they got another thought coming because God's going to anoint some Davids in here. Yes, the devil is bold. Yes, the devil is bad. But I want you to know that the greatest one is on our side. He came a little closer, but he didn't know that he was signing his own death warrant. And they said, David said, tell me. And verse 25 says, and it shall be that the man who killed this giant, the, the, the king will enrich him with great riches and give him his daughter and make his, and make his household uh, tax free in Israel. Watch this. And David spake to the men that stood by him saying, what, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? And, and see, this is, what, this is what David was concerned about. And take away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine uh, that he should defy the armies of the living God? See, to David, it was a God thing. It wasn't a military thing. It wasn't a political thing, but it was a God thing. And this stuff that's going on today, it's a God thing. David said, who do he think he is? I know he's nine feet, nine inches tall. I know he weighs 500 pounds, but God's bigger than nine feet, nine inches. God's greater than 500 pounds. Said, I wanna know what's gonna happen. And this man is defying God. And the people answered. And they told him what they told him before. Now here comes Eliab, David's oldest brother. Now notice this. Eliab reminds me of some of these preachers. They will preach. They will preach against preachers. They will preach against hooping. They will preach against shouting. They will preach against holiness. They will preach and call us old fashioned. They'll make fun of us for dressing up. They throw off on us because we shout, but they won't preach against sin. Notice Eliab, he's gonna put David on front street, but you couldn't make him open his mouth against Goliath. When it was time to stand against Goliath, he said nothing. And all of a sudden, he's getting ready to hit an easy target and to try to embarrass his little brother because his brother had more heart than he had. I learned that it's not the size of the man that's in the fight, but it's the size of the heart that's in the man. Yeah! Yeah! How many have a warrior's heart in this place today? Let me hear the warriors give God a battle cry. Somebody by the 
the hands and what kind of heart do you have? I see your stature. I see your size. I see your height. I see your weight. But what about your heart? just begin to ask David bombard him with questions and wouldn't even give him time to answer what are you doing here what are you doing here why are you down here and the text tells us that he was angry why came this down down here and with whom look at him trying to belittle him did you leave those few sheep within the wilderness then he uh, attacked his, uh, his character. I know your pride. And I know your naughtiness. You got a bad heart. And then he accused him of being immature. You're only down here because you want to see the battle. But uh, notice what Eli uh, Eliab had. It's hard to preach and teach. He had misplaced aggression. That's what gets me today. Some of these preachers, boy, when they preach about you getting your stuff and your things back, oh, they're, they, are, they are on fire talking about material possession. But when you throw out a real issue, they ain't got nothing to say about abortion. They don't have anything to say about adultery. I've seen preachers and they preach hard about the Black Panther, a stupid movie, a movie that was concocted in the mind of a white Jewish man named Stan Lee. Black folk treated that movie like it was a worship service. The Black Panther was nothing but a mythical character and you got excited about a mythical character and a mythical land. Good God Almighty. And if you watch the movie, there was nothing new about it. One black man killed another black man over drugs. That happens every day. There was some kind of drug that they had and one man fought the other man to kill the drug. Then the white man got into the flying craft and rescued everybody. That's about it. But when we talk about the cross, when we talk about on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross you can't hardly find these guys but i wonder who'll get excited about the cross who'll get excited about jesus let me see you praise the lord about the goodness of the lord he's good he's kind he's holy he's real and he's mine Is he yours? Yeah! Woo! No wonder. No wonder. No wonder. When Samuel got ready to anoint one of David's sons, Samuel, I uh, saw you. Samuel said, I know God sent me down here. Went straight to Eliab. Eliab was big like Saul. Looked like a soldier. Built like a soldier. Tall like a soldier. Samuel got ready to pour the oil on him. God said, no, no, uh-uh, no, 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 look. God says, I don't see the way man sees. Man looketh on the outward appearance. God said, but I, I checked the heart. He ain't got it. Abinadab, don't you put no oil on him. Shema, don't put any oil on him. And the other sons didn't even get named. And then I heard him, I heard, I heard Samuel say, well, don't you have one more child? And I, mm, I heard Jesse say, I've got one more son. Uh, he keeps the sheep. Uh, he's ready. And uh, he's in the back back there. Samuel said, go get him. 
They went and got David. Isn't it amazing who God chooses? The very one that everybody else writes off. The very one that everyone else says can't preach. The very one that everybody else says can't sing. The very one that everybody else says will amount to nothing. God will take that person and set them on high. Oh, Lord! Do I have anybody here who can say he chose me? I was nothing. I was headed nowhere fast. But the Lord, the Lord, oh, the Lord, he chose, he chose me. Yeah, he did. Brought David down, brought David down and anointed him to be the next king. Now, David says to his oldest brother, what have I done wrong? Now, you, you, you didn't give me a chance to answer your question. Praise the Lord. Because that, that, that answers to the question. Number one, uh, what, why am I down here? According to verse 17, my daddy sent me. That's it. That's it right there. That's Number two, where did I leave those sheep? According to verse 20, with the keeper of the sheep. Amen. Number three, you say you know me, but in fact, you don't know me. That's why you got rejected and I got anointed. You don't know anything. Amen. Last question. You won't know why I'm down here on the battlefield. Why am I so close? Well, dad told me to find you all and get a clear report and get your record and bring it back to him. That's why I'm here. But, since I'm here, and this man is defying us, and won't none of y'all fight, can I just ask a question? Can I just look into it? Can, can I, can I, can I? See, because, see, I, I, see, because the reason why I want to ask this question is, see, I, I've had uh, some experiences. See, see, eventually David ended up before Saul, and, and, and uh, I'm done. But David said this, David said, now, Saul said, you can't fight him. You are just a youth. Saul said, but he'd been trained from war from his youth. David said, you're right. He said, but sir, I do have some references and some experiences to draw from. Uh, I, I, I've never fought Goliath. But uh, one day, a bear came, and, and, and a bear can grow to six feet nine inches tall. They can weigh between 400 and 1,200 pounds. Good God Almighty. And uh, the bear came and took one of my sheep, and not only a bear, but a lion. A male lion can be five to eight inches long, three feet high at the shoulder, not counting the head and the mane. And you know, sir, when a human being bites into a steak, we have at least 150 to 200 pounds per square inch. Good God Almighty. But when a lion bites into uh, something, it generates 1,000 pounds per square inch and a bear 950 pounds per square inch. Oh, Lord. And the average lion, sir, is 20 times stronger than a man. 
And the average bear is four times stronger than humans. And sir, a grizzly bear is able to chop a, cut a person to decapitate a human being with one blow. Break the back of a wolf with one strike. And uh, both of them came against the sheep. And I didn't have an army. I didn't have a whole lot of people on my side. But I had the Lord on my side. Yeah, yeah, Lord. Go to shake somebody's hand and say, I had the Lord on my side. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. You don't have to touch anybody, but just tell them, Goliath is only big to you because you hadn't fought a lion, nor a bear. But I've been in a few battles. I've been in a few, I've had some experiences. I've seen God heal. I've seen God deliver. The lightning flashing. I had the thunder roll. Hey! Yeah, hey! And he said, The same God who delivered me from the lion. Uh, and from the bear. I slew them. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. <laughs> and, uh, and this uncircumcised Philistine, I tell you right now, he will be as one of them. And I know that the lion and the bear, I just told you how powerful their paws are. David said, God delivered me. From that paw. The paw could have decapitated me. Had it, had it hit my back, it would have broke my spine. Had it hit my leg, it would have taken my leg off. Had it hit my neck, it would have taken my head off. But God! I need about I need about a hundred folk to shout. But God! Shout again! Shout again! Shout again! God, but God, but God, oh Lord. So, if you read, you will see that the story ends rather anti-climatically. For David steps out. And Goliath is insulted. Mr. Arrogant, am I a dog that you would send this child out to fight me? Am I a dog? And you coming at me with staves? And he cursed David. And he cursed David's God. See, that's the thing about David. It didn't bother David for the man to curse him. See, I told you, for David, it was always a theological issue. See, some of this, see, I'm, that's what I'm trying to tell you. All this stuff you see going on, it's about God. It's about Jesus Christ. It is whether, whether it is played out in politics, whether it is played out in sports, whether, however it's played out, it's about whether or not you believe the Bible and the God of the Bible and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. He cursed David, nothing happened. He cursed David's God. David said, uh-oh. Now nah, you, 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 you're done. And uh, David told him, you come at me, praise the Lord, 
Verse 44, and the Philistines said to David, come to me, and I will give your flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beast of the field. Nine feet, nine inches tall, five, six hundred pounds, and, and 175 pounds of armor on. And David said to the Philistine, thou comest, comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the army of Israel whom thou hast defied. Somebody shout, it's in the name of Jesus. Hit that rocket one time. It's in the name of Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus. Ah, it's in the name of Jesus. Throw your hands up. Woo. I come in the name of Jesus. Somebody praise the Lord in here. I come in the name of the Lord whom you have defiled and uh, not, not, not the 42nd but this day will the Lord deliver thee into my hands and I will smite thee and I, look at this little boy and see uh, they, he couldn't have said it today because you know had he said this today he would have been a bully he'd have been a bully this is a messed up society. Regardless of what you think of the president, you, 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 he called MS-13 gang members animals. Oh, how horrible. Let him catch you. You know who should have got mad when the president called them animals? The animals. I ain't got but one. When I heard that, I, I just asked one question. Is a dog an animal? Is a dog an animal? Is a dog an animal? Jesus called them dogs. Cast not, give not that which is holy unto. All right then, so at the end of that, David tells him, I'm going to cut your head off. Oh, Judge, had he said it today, all oh, the news. Did you hear what he said? What kind of warrior is that? Oh, people talking about waterboard. Ain't nobody ever died from waterboarding. Nobody. Right. Nobody. We don't, don't waterboard the enemy. Had it not been for waterboarding, we wouldn't have got that information right. to get Bin Laden. Right. And now, now, how, how are you going to fight by not fighting? Right. 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 Send our soldiers over there and they couldn't put the magazines in the gun unless they were fired upon. No wonder, you're sitting duck. Oh my God, you're, sit, you're sitting duck. David, David said, no, I'm gonna beat you today and, and oh, I'm cutting off that big head of yours. Oh Lord. Anderson Cooper and Don Lyman would have had a hissy fit. Can you believe what he's, can you believe what he said? You can't fight. You can't fight. You can't talk. You can't have a conversation. Everything now. Everybody's offended. I don't know what kind of world this is. Don't want men to be masculine. And uh, J. Crew has a new t-shirt out that is pink. The thing that's sold out for boys. And you know it's written on the pink shirt by J. Crew for boys that is sold out. In a, little, in a church cost about $20, $25. So for the little boys, little boys don't have any money. So their parents bought it. It's called child abuse. Parents bought it. Parents are gonna put their little boys in a t-shirt, a shirt by J. Crew, the pink, that has written on the shirt, I'm a feminist too. Can I ask a question? Any time, any time for somebody to step up and say something? 
I ain't gonna cuss, but something ought to be said. <laughs> Woo! David says, I'm going to cut your head off and I'm going to give thy carcass. Oh, my Lord. Oh, no, this is too, this is too much. Oh, God. Let me cover my children's ears. Uh, the wife, honey, let me cover your ears. Don't want you to hear this. That go wooden going off. I will give thy carcass, the carcass of, uh, of the host of the Philistines this, this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not by sword, not by spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. The battle is the Lord's. And it came to pass. When the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. Boy, I love David. So Goliath gets up, starts walking toward David. David didn't run from him. And David didn't walk toward him. Bob said, David, haste, ran toward him. Woo, he, he, wasn't like, he wasn't like us. Ran toward him. We're always trying to get away. Trying to duck. Trying to shirk our responsibilities. Call for prayer. If I call for prayer right now, I have to leave. Because you, you, you are professional prayer dodgers. You're running the wrong way. David ran toward him. Isn't that something? Verse 49. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a whole bunch of rocks. No, a stone. And slung it. <laughs> I told you that. I mean, the battle, it was anticlimactic. One stone. I mean, this thing, this thing was shorter than a Tyson fight. <laughs> folk, folk were still coming in with that popcorn. Mike Tyson to knock the man out. <laughs> Guy trying to get his seat. Excuse me. Bang, 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 bang. What? <laughs> Fight's over. <laughs> See, David was the first Tyson. Short fight, quick fight, quick, 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 quick. quick. Folk, was, folk were wondering, they were closing their eyes to see what was going to happen. And open their eyes again, fight's over. over. David took a rock, took one stone, and slung it. And smote the man, smote him in his forehead. And you know, his helmet had brass that covered his forehead. Stone went through the brass. It hit him in his forehead, and the stone sunk in his forehead. And I see him now. Boom! It's about like uh, them wrestlers. Don't nobody know how to fall like them professional wrestlers. Yes, sir. But no, 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 no. Let's don't go professional. Let's go MMA when oh. they're falling for real. Oh, you just lose it. Oh, my God. Just good night, Irene. When David hit him, when David hit him, the show was over. The man fell. To the owner's face to the earth and David prevailed took took then took Goliath's sword it's a big one and cut the man's head off with his own sword just gruesome bloody David she got to get, get dirty sometimes we're David's we're called to be deliverers. Pastor, that don't sound quite like Bible. Well, I guess Jesus was wrong too. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus looked at his disciples 
and said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. You are. You. Speaking of them, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. But they put it on a candlestick that all might see the light. Then I heard him say, so therefore let your light so shine. Let it shine like a candle on a candlestick. Let it shine. Let it give light. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I preach too long. There come a time when we have to get delivered. There come a time where we have to let God position us to be solutions, to be answers, to be people who help others get delivered. Not always needing deliverance ourselves. I don't want to be an Eliab who would talk big to my brothers and sisters but ain't got nothing to say to the devil. I don't want to be a Saul who will sit down and, and have a conversation with a child and then let the youth go and fight his battle. Then put his armor on David. And the Bible said, David says, I can't fight in this because I haven't tested it. You know, everybody says that Saul's armor was too big. That's not what David said. David never said it was. He, said, he just said, this is not what I used to fight with. It, it restricts me too much. We don't know whether it was too big. It might have fit just fine. Amen. When the Bible says that David was ruddy, ruddy is not little, it's lean. He was ripped. He wasn't a fat slob. He was ripped. He was strong. Strong guy. I'm mean, serious, seriously. You want to know, right? You want to know? I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you the truth. I told you you'd be too sensitive. I can't, you, can't, you can't say anything anymore. I, it, it, that's a dilemma for people like me. I'm trying to figure out, Lord, help me. Because I'm trying to preach, you see. I'm trying, I'm trying to get folk delivered. But you got to get them to live with a bunch of euphemisms. So, he goes out and he fights. He fights with what he knows. You believers, when you're out in the world, stop trying to remember the world's talking points. Stop trying to bring the world's lingo in here. Use what you know. Use church nomenclature. See, I, look, I can fight with scripture. I, I can fight saying what the Bible says. I've tested it. I proved it. That's what I know. Now, if I try to go out there and be anything other than a preacher and what God called me to be, I can't fight with that. See, I can't pretend that I'm a politician. I'm not one of them. I can't pretend that I'm a medical doctor. That's not what I do. In, 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 a t in approaching the issues of society, I can't approach them with a Muslim worldview. I don't know anything about that. A Buddhist worldview, a secular worldview. People say, well, leave the Bible out of it sometime. Can't do it. Hadn't tested it. Don't know that kind of fight. But I know what to fight with. And when the devil, when the devil, when my wife uh, needed surgery, I didn't call on faith because I don't have faith in faith. I never said, I'm just going to be positive. There's no deliverance in that. I never said, praise God. I'm just going to keep on believing. Mm -mm. I said, I'm putting my faith in the Lord. In the God of the Bible. That's what I know. I didn't go and I wasn't tempted to go get drunk. I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to smoke. I didn't want any drugs. I don't know that. Mm-mm. Didn't need anything mind altering. Didn't need a value. But I know how to pray. These are the things. You fight with what you know. Today let's fight with what we know. Let's allow the Lord to use us. You're stronger than you think you are. You're more powerful than you think you are. You just got to use what you know. Praise the Lord. 
when you go into these secular settings, you have to do your job, but you don't have to become secular. Go by the company policy, do what you do, but you can't, you can't fight with tools that you don't know. I want to be a David. I want to be a solution. I want to save when sinners. I want to reach the lost. I want to, I want to, I don't want to be a Christian in survival mode that the, the best I can manage is for me to come and get delivered every Sunday. I want to get delivered and then go out and get others and bring them in. I want to, I want to, I want to be. I want to be a difference maker. Praise the Lord. I want to help my church. 